Um, and by adding a constant, it's, it's useful to think of that as a shift cipher, right? That uh, you're just shifting two alphabets side by side. But in the frequency distribution, still in the same order, it's just slid and uh, it, you just shifted it. And the same thing, like it XORing a file, uh, XORing a value. So you've got a key, a randomly chosen key that you're XORing with the, every value, 8 bit XOR, um, yields a set of, of values. And, but depending on the key you choose, uh, it can, there can be any mapping between the plane and cipher. So this 8 bit key is really the equivalent of a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. But still, structure pops through that because even with a limited, well, a limited number with one key like that, it, there's a reason why one time pads have an infinite uh, or have a, a key applied, a random value XORed with every value in a file because otherwise structure pops through. So anyway, thinking from 8-bit uh, XOR to 16-bit XOR, you, you have um, eight, 16 bits. So the first eight bits is key one applied to byte one and applied to uh, the second eight goes to byte two and then you reuse the keys and essentially what you've got is a two alphabet polyalphabetic, uh, poly, um, poly, I'm losing my mind. Yeah, there. one of those. Yeah, polyalphabetic. Uh, so you've got a two alphabet polyalphabetic cipher and if you've done a 32 bit XOR, you have four bytes essentially and you keep using, or four keys and you're reusing those. So essentially you have four alphabets. So what you'll see on the diagram, for example, is that you're, you'll be seeing double or quadruple of the usual picture, but it will still be the usual picture because neither of those methods actually destroys your bigrams. It transforms them, makes them into different bigrams, but does not destroy them entirely. Demo? Sure. Um, and then as I mentioned before that if your number of keys uh, go all the way up to the, match the number of bytes, if you're, then you hit uh, a one-time pad. So that what you're talking about, those, those values become more and more diffused as you increase the, the size of the key. And I think, so demo time. So let's see that. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you what these are. So you have to tell me what they are. Okay. So the byte plot, what does that look like? It looks kind of text like, okay. And I'll get, uh, so that is correct. And then if you f adjust the size, you get lined up right. What do you see in the middle? Yeah, you can see vertical bars. But look at the digraph plot. Remember, if it was all uppercase and all lowercase, you should just have the lower right block being you know, the common digraphs. But we're seeing digraphs of many pairs within the printable ASCII range. Bing, good. This is base 64 encoding. Okay. So the first part is you see what what does this indicate? The the digraph view indicates what? Yeah, it, it, it now we're Actual. we're doing something here though. And actually let me let me slot do this. Okay? As I slide through the file, it's shifting. So think back to the addons, adding and subtracting a constant as a simple encoding technique. So here we've added zero. If you go uh, through the file, like say in this bottom right corner, we've added 255 to every value. So what it's done is shifted it all the way to the right. So again, this shows you that just simply adding or subtracting a value, it's kind of like a known plain text attack, right? You know it's uh, ASCII text going in. If you try and obscure it with um, just a, uh, a simple adding or subtracting a constant, remember shift cipher, it, uh, it just shifts, literally shifts the digraph. So and you, here is a looking glass that sees through that obfuscation. Yeah. And then as you slide, you can notice as you go through the file, it gets brighter and brighter because it's getting higher and higher order bits until it wraps around. And then back down. Okay. So what we've done here as you see this rainbow effect, we've applied in, um, a key to each of those, an 8-bit key. Um, 8 bit XOR. So we've, we've chosen a random 8 bit key and applied it to, uh, I think it's 20 lines at a time. 
So you can see this rainbow effect where it's chosen to XOR a different range. But as you play this, you can see that, that the structure still is there. You've, you've done 8-bit XOR and it still, regardless of the key, where this is like exhaustively going through the entire key space and you can see that each of the potential keys still has a distinct st structure shining through. And part of it is th this, there's that one region, that, that darker block, that you know, here it's in the top left, that you, know, that you can think about that given the key that was chosen, the input was very high in a certain range, 32 to 127, but actually probably lowercase letters, th that range is what shines through. And then even if you do 16-bit XOR, so it's just two alphabets, right? So when the, al when the keys, uh, you, you can see the two alphabets here popping through in, in this uh, attractor, I'm sorry. So you can see the, the two, one key had the effect of shifting it here, the other key put it down in the lower left quadrant. And then as you play through and different keys are chosen, they, sh they show up in different places. So this is an indicator of text being XORed with a, um, you know, 16-bit key. Yeah, you would get the same effect if you composed two uh, very different languages uh, that have their own uh, natural uh, digraph structure, nat natural bigram structure, uh, but uh, they just simply don't mesh. Either that or you're seeing double. So this one's a little different. When I coded it, I, um, I forgot to do one thing. So I, it, when I wrote this, I intended, okay, this is going to be 32-bit XOR. But as it turns out, um, I only uh, made, it's really 24-bit XOR and the last key, the, the, third, the fourth value was zero. So what you see then are these vertical lines here. All right, see the, the vertical lines, that's because every fourth uh, byte value is zero. And I confirmed that by looking at it. But anyway, it showed you something was amiss. That even when we play this though, this is essentially 24-bit XOR. You can see the different alphabets still popping through the key. They're popping through the obfuscation technique. And it might be hard to see, but at the, the digraph, if you think about one, if one of the keys is zero, um, you, you've got digraphs here then. So, uh, I'm sorry, not if one of the keys is zero. Yeah, you, you get digraphs of, uh, the bytes of the key. yeah, the bytes of the key at the, at the top and at the bottom. Okay. I think that was it for these. Okay, so I think. Let's go on. Yeah. So we've shown you visually what this looks like. And now we've done, now each of these lines is a thousand samples as pure as we could make them of that given type. So at the top, um, we have random examples, encrypted examples, compressed examples, um, and the left red box is average byte value. The right va uh, line or right box is uh, the uh, entropy, Shannon entropy. So what we have is, um, so you see high entropy, you know, this cluster. And then, but you notice that there's statistically difference, uh, difference between the encoded version, still the high entropy, we encoded zip files, uh, but the average byte values are significantly different. Machine code, against significantly different. Bitmaps, but with bitmaps, recall that they could be anything, so they're very diverse in our samples, and the, the standard deviation there is 69, which is huge, which means it's all over the place. And then text, um, again, a pretty consistent view. So we plotted those, uh, one uh, entropy versus byte value, and the idea is there's intuition here that we can programmatically detect some of these things. Uh, you've got, a, now the high entropy cluster, it's really hard, that's a non-trivial problem to, to pull that apart, but as a unit, the idea of you know, high entropy, uh, that can be detected pretty straightforward. Uh, pulling out the base 64 encoding and, and UU encoding, pretty straightforward for our experiments. Of course there's going to be noise and there's going to be things, you, unanticipated things. Machine code stands out, ASCII text uh, and bitmaps. And it would be interesting in the, in the future to draw these boxes based on the standard deviations, you know, kind of get a feel for how big each region is. It's a little bit bigger or, or smaller than the, the marker that we've used. So, and these are only two, uh, these are only two um, possible statistics that you can throw at the thing. Mm -hmm. They're really, uh, yeah, and they're really well known, well understood and simple. Now imagine what you can do if you take 
uh, an aggregate of uh, 10 or more statistics, what kind of clusters would emerge? Some of those actually do catch the artifacts of compression uh, and um, of particular kinds of encryption, especially if the key is not chosen wisely and if proper padding is not applied. So you might actually be able to visually detect uh, decrypt, uh, encryption with a key uh, that wasn't chosen properly or uh, with a key with or where the right padding scheme, scheme uh, was not used. Uh, now let's do something else. Let's try to see visually how some things are like the others and others are not. Uh, the inspiration here is this wonderful, wonderful uh, work done by two physicists who managed to reproduce almost entirely the phylogenetic tree of languages by taking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in every language in which it, in which it was written and compressing those uh, files uh, together and separately and noticing how much better they actually compressed together. The idea being that while you're compressing one file, you are uh, already working up a string table and that string, string table helps you compress the other file better. And so this is what we did to binary fragments. And you get those uh, bathroom tile kind of uh, pictures where you have many fragments of different types. You group them and then you see how well or what the compressed file would look like. So in this byte plot, I'm taking uh, a, a Linux x86 executable uh, and compressing it with the uh, rest of the uh, x86 Linux executables, so it's home team, so to say. And uh, instead of collapsing the strings that are in my string table for compression, which is how the lentil zip compression works, instead of collapsing them, I color them in their entirety with the color that um, uh, the, 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 darker, uh, the darker it is, uh, the more frequent that um, uh, string, the, the more frequently that string is known to appear in that uh, corpus. And so you see that uh, there are pretty long runs of, uh, for, of, of uh, strings that were found. So uh, those are verbatim uh, repeated in other files like that. Whereas if I, config, if I compress it with uh, my bunch of bitmaps, uh, it doesn't look so good. In fact, uh, I, get, uh, I don't get long blocks at all. Uh, I get short blocks and some of those are just bytes, which means uh, I ran out of uh, my uh, string table and uh, I am not seeing uh, the same strings that I was seeing when I was generating the string table. Uh, now, some of those things are more like the others. This is the executable code uh, compressed with music. And you see certain periodic structure. These things actually uh, occur in code as well. Uh, but they're not long and their distribution is strange. So uh, these are the, the, those triples that you know, could be executable code. So uh, I'm going to show that um, with luck. I'm going to show that live. Do I have the, Do we have the time? A couple of minutes. Let's see if this works. Uh, if uh, if this doesn't, uh, then uh, we'll give you the demo. 